Welcome everybody. This is the WCCI 2020 tutorial on uh, deep learning for graphs and I am Davide Baccio. I am uh, an associate professor at the computer science department at the University of Pisa and I'm a member of the computational intelligence and, uh, and machine learning group. I will be saying more about, about me uh, in a couple of, uh, of seconds. The first thing uh, What's the outline of this tutorial? So basically, uh, this tutorial in the next uh, hour and a half would guide you through an introduction in uh, a very active and exciting area of research in uh, neural networks deep learning community, which is that of uh, dealing with graph structure data. And in particular, we will enter what is called the deep learning for graphs uh, field and touch some of the main approaches that have been presented so far, uh, taking a fun, uh, let's say a, an approach in which we will start from some foundational models which root uh, way back uh, in, in the past and before the, let's say, the so-called deep learning revolution, we're talking about the 90s of the last century, and then uh, the wave of rediscovery of this field that has happened since, let's say, the 2015, 2014. Uh, which has uh, led in the last years to this a uh, lot of increasing attention on, on the topic of uh, uh, adaptive processing of graph structured information. And uh, from that onwards, we will touch some of the main contribution until we get to the final part of this tutorial, in which we're going to be focusing on more advanced uh, and uh, research oriented topics, uh, area of interesting research, or where one uh, a junior researcher might invest some, might want to invest uh, some effort because it's a potentially interesting uh, research area. We will briefly uh, wrap up talking about some of the um, more interesting, mature or possibly uh, open for contribution application areas. But before we delve into that, a couple of words about me. I am already, uh, already said that I'm uh, I'm working at the computer science department in, in uh, University of Pisa. Uh, this department is the largest, uh, is the oldest computer science department in, uh, in, in Italy. And uh, uh, I've been working since uh, 2008, nine on learning for structured data. In fact, now I'm also, uh, I've also the honor of chairing one of the IEEE task force and specifically the one focused on learning for structured data. Don't worry, I will be providing you some, with some advertising bits at the end of the talk. So if you're interested into uh, following up the activities of this task force, maybe help and join the task force. And I am part in the computer science department of a group, which is called the Computational Intelligence and Machine Learning Group, where we've been working since the 90s on, well, not specifically me, as I was slightly younger than that, but uh, uh, people at the group have been working on learning for structured data since, since that ages. And so we have a um, strong, uh, uh, let's say, background on adaptive processing of what we call structured data, which goes from simple structures such as sequences uh, to more complex uh, information uh, through structured form to the focus of this, uh, this tutorial, which is graph structure data with plenty of, uh, plenty of applications. And well, needless to say, I need to also to uh, acknowledge the fact that I'm um, secretary of the Italian Association for Artificial Intelligence. So if you're an Italian uh, researcher or somebody operating as a researcher on the Italian soil, and if you're interested, just Google us and contact me if you want any, any information about what is uh, the activity of our scientific association for artificial intelligence. So this said, let's get to the, to the business, okay? And first thing first, what is graph structure data? So this, this tutorial assumes zero knowledge about, about the background, okay? So uh, let's start from the beginning. What is a graph? A graph is something like that, the picture that you see in this slide. And this picture that you see in this slide is already providing you with a couple of interesting bits about graph structure data. Okay, so a graph is made out of nodes, which are those circles, of course, and these nodes are linked by 
edges, what we call edges, these lines or arrows that are there, okay? So uh, throughout the course, I will, uh, throughout the tutorial, I will refer to nodes or vertices alternatively, and I often call them U or V, to denote one specific uh, uh, ID for one specific node or vertex, okay? So uh, one important bit of information that is attached to graphs is a label, which is not, uh, the, you don't have to interpret this as the classical label that you expect in machine learning, so the target of a supervised prediction, there can be also that, that thing. But here we're talking about a bit of information, some information which is encoded, for instance, in a vector, which is attached to, to a node. In particular, in this case, we see a node labeled as XV, okay? We're gonna be having the same, uh, a similar thing attached to node, you and all the other nodes in my graph. And this is basically already telling that a graph is a form of compound information because it's a, it's a complex bit of information broken down into atomic pieces, which, is, which correspond to these uh, node labels. And these atomic pieces are connected by relationship. And guess what? The relationship are, in, are defined by these arrows in the graph, by the edge, okay? And here we see already that we can have an oriented edge, an arc, which uh, we called E V V, meaning that that's an oriented arc going from node V to node U. And that represents a sort of relationship between the information in node view, V and then, uh, the information in node U. For instance, since this is, a, is an oriented edge, the kind of information we might want to be, uh, let's say, uh, encoding into, into, the, in that, into that arc is the fact that somehow V is the cause of U, okay? That is why we might uh, want to use an oriented edge. Uh, note also that we, uh, in a general case, we would like to be free to attach some form of label also to the arc. So uh, we can have other bits of information attached not only to the nodes but to the arcs. Okay, but the arcs can also be undirected. The yeah, edges can be undirected. Why? Because possibly the kind of uh, information that I want, that the relationship that I want to represent between two, two nodes is a symmetric one. So no need to, uh, to define a direction, okay? Actually, the things can get a little bit more articulated than that because you might have multiple arcs existing between, between nodes. And this means basically that you might have another, another arc here entering from V to U, which is a, represented some different form of information from the existing one, the one that, it, that is in blue, because I can assign a type to the arc. So for instance, the first, the blue arc is representing some sort of uh, friendship information, and the red arc that has just drawn is, uh, is representing some sort of, uh, um, let's say, uh, relationship, work-related uh, relationship, okay? Since they both exist, and uh, we represent them both with two different arcs with two different types. And this can be generalized to multiple type of relationships. Here you see one of the, or po possibly the tricky bits in an in arc, that is a cycle. The fact that you have nodes that are mutually connected, that they can enter this bit of the, this bit of the graph, enter it here, and you can start Okay, walking into the path, into the graph, following the, the direction of the connectivity and end up exactly in the same point you were before and start again going through it. And depending on the type of algorithms you use to do that, you might forget about the fact that you've passed already in there. Okay, we're going to see that when we do, mm, when we use graphs into into uh, adaptive models, what happens is that these mutual dependencies induce mutual dependencies in the encoding, in the, let's say, in the numerical representation that we try to find for the nodes. And we have to sort these mutual dependencies between nodes somehow in order to find a consistent and coherent encoding for, for the nodes. Okay, so this is just to say that structures, we love structures because they are useful to represent relational information present within the data. Let me try to give you a motivating example. 
it's probably no longer needed since the applications of deep learning for graphs now are becoming more and more uh, present into, into the literature. But just to mention that whenever we talk about a, a chemical molecule, such as in, uh, in this case here, okay, we are saying that, that that molecule is basically a graph which represents the relationship between the atoms, okay, the chemical chemical physical relationship in the, in the graphs. And why is it important to deal with the graph structure, the representation of a molecule? Because that conveys information about its functionality, okay? And other forms of, uh, of graphs are, even if it, they don't look like, these are point clouds, okay? This is not really uh, straightforward to interpret as a graph because what they are basically is non-Euclidean data, okay? But non-Euclidean data, you know, you can build a graph out of it by considering the k nearest neighbor. So a locality of a point and you can build a graph out of it. And well, this is more, way more straightforward because here in this case, we are basically, basically uh, identifying what is a social graph of some sort or a, gra uh, or a network that uh, uh, defines some uh, relationship between, between members. And these members can be people, these members can be diseases, this member can be proteins that we are gonna see uh, through, uh, through this tutorial. But there are also uh, interesting and more novel application. This is, this is another form of graph which represents a piece of software. And a piece of software is a graph. If you think about the simplest case, an abstract syntax tree from, from a piece of code, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a structure and it's an acyclic one, but depending on how elaborate is the uh, kind of information that you want, you come up with graphs that represent code, with graphs that represent uh, the runtime of an ICT system, uh, which is basically representing uh, the relationship between uh, different components of, uh, of a computing system and their interaction, their mutual call, their REST calls, uh, whatever comes to can come to our mind that describes the dynamic uh, relationship between the software components interacting with each other. Now, uh, let's start now delving into, into the models and let me do that by starting with an historical perspective, uh, which also hides a geographical perspective and I may say that from uh, this perspective is, is very much partial because it's highly related with uh, the place I'm sitting in right now, which is that green bit of Italy and that green bit of Italy is called Tuscany and it's where these two universities are, my university, University of Pisa and University of Siena, which is where between 2005 and 2009 have appeared the first two uh, neural networks that were capable of, of dealing with uh, um, graphs containing cycles, okay? With, uh, they, it's interesting because they were presented at the same time, okay? Both uh, models appeared first as a conference paper in 2005 and then as a journal paper on the transaction on neural networks and learning systems, was transaction on neural networks only at that time, in 2009, okay? As separate works, and with completely uh, different approach. And we're gonna get into that. Also be aware that in reality, uh, both approaches formed on, uh, on the first uh, extension of the neuron to structure data, which is due uh, to Alessandro Sperduti and Antonina Starita, uh, which at the time they were both uh, working for University of Pisa and was developed in 1997. The difference is that that generalized recursive neuron wasn't yet capable of dealing with general with general classes of graphs containing containing cycles, not not in an effective way yet. This came afterwards with uh, with uh, let's go into it. Uh, on the one end, the approach by Siena, by Scarselli and Gori, uh, which is called graph neural network, and the approach that uh, Scarselli, Gori, and others um, took in order to deal with, uh, with cycles, because let's, let's uh, um, get this straight. The issue with graphs is how you deal with, with the cycles, okay? So the whole point was to understand how to find an encoding for this guy here, which is a, which is a node in a graph, uh, using the information from, for instance, this guy here and this guy here, which, uh, and the information for L3 and L4, 
at the same time depends on L1. So there is a, this mutual dependency, which we need somehow to break because we cannot define a uh, complete ordering between nodes as we can do with, uh, with sequences. If you consider sequences are very simple graphs in which time zero comes before time one, uh, before time two and so on. So there is a complete order. We can neither define a partial ordering like in, uh, in trees. In trees, I have a partial ordering because I have a single root node to start from. And based on that, I can order the rest of the structure because I can start providing uh, indexes to the, to the nodes starting from root, which is zero. The first, the, the leftmost, leftmost child of a node is gonna be uh, number one, uh, uh, number one, then number two, then number three, and so on. So this implicitly provides an ordering, although partial in graphs, I have no such thing due to the fact that I don't have, I do have cycles, okay? Now, how they, they dealt with, uh, with cycles in the graph neural network is through a straight extension of the recursive neural network, of the recursive neuron from, uh, from Stary Kasperbuti. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but they handle the mutual dependencies by, in, by using a fixed point approach, basically. They impose uh, some weight constraints which were imposed dynamically so across during the uh, the learning phase so the weights of this neural network there was basically underlying everything that was a there is a uh, recursive neural network uh, whose weight are constrained during the learning process in order to implement a contraction the fact that we are implementing a contraction makes sure that the state mapping so the mapping from a label from an from a node, let's pick up this as a node, okay? From this node to its vectorial representation is contractive, meaning that if I am computing this, uh, let's say this uh, encoding uh, iteratively, multiple times having this encoding being uh, reused for updating L4 and using the updated L4 to update L1, this, let's say, mutual uh, this mutual influence between uh, between the respective encodings at some point uh, leads to a convergent process because there is a contractive mapping. So this vector uh, that changes. So let me represent a vector as a point in space. So changes. Sorry about that. So changes to to this uh, to this vector here would be mo movements in this space. And this movement in this space will slowly and slowly and slowly and slowly converge to a fixed point. Okay, at some point, the state mapping of a node will stop changing during the iteration, having reached the fixed point, and that could be considered the encoding for the node. Okay, so this is a completely uh, dynamic approach. So the neural network that is underlying this is our current recursive neural network. Okay. Now, the alternative approach, the approach from uh, Alessio Micheli in, uh, from University of Pisa, again, you can see transaction neural network from 2009, is that of a completely forward network. Okay? So, uh, what you see there on the left hand side is a very simple graph. It's a graph with four nodes. Okay? And this very simple graph, uh, let's focus on this node here. Okay, this node here is mutually dependent on a set of nodes. But I really don't care why, because I'm basically having these nodes, okay, all the four nodes at level one, so this is a multi-layer neural network, at level one of the network, I'm be pa I'll be passing each of these nodes independently through some neural lay, sorry, neural layer here. Okay, and this is a fit forward neural network layer, which is gonna be providing an encoding of the, of, the, uh, of the node. Okay, so at level one, what this, let's say, a small neural network here is receiving is just the label attached to the node. The label attached to this node, the label attached to the blue node, and so on, and for each of the nodes is creating a vectorial encoding. Now, this vectorial encoding is then fed to this gray, uh, to this gray bit, this gray bit is you can consider it as, as a readout, as an output layer, which tries to solve 
a supervised learning problem. I will solve it with a certain error. If this error is not acceptable, what I will do is I will add a new layer and note that this is an incremental approach, okay? The original paper from Michele uh, built a completely uh, incremental approach in which layers are added on a per need basis, okay? Until you meet your error criteria, okay? Or you're stalled and you can no longer uh, decrease your error. So this second layer, okay, is gonna be doing exactly as the first layer. So feeding each of these neurons in independently, uh, trying to find for each of these neurons at level two independently and encoding, okay? But in order to do so, it will be considering not only the label attached to the node, but also it will use the encoding from the neighbors from the previous layer, okay? And the fact that I'm using the encoding, the encodings from the from the uh, nodes at the previous layer uh, breaks the condition, the, the dependencies, okay? The mutual dependencies. Why? Because bl the blue node will only be dependent from the white node at the previous level. The white node at level two, for instance, this leftmost node at, uh, at uh, node two will depend on the blue node, yes, but on the blue node representation at level one not at the current one that has been just computed. So there is no longer this mutual dependency that requires a contractive mapping, okay? And the also the other bit is consider that each time you, you train a layer, after that layer is trained, you freeze the layer, okay? That, that is what at least this uh, neural network request was doing. So you added incrementally new layers while freezing the previous one. And this is somehow that, uh, one thing that is derived from uh, uh, cascade correlation uh, like approach to uh, the, from Falman, Falman and Lavier. Now these two are the say the fathers, these two models are the fathers of the um, of the neural network for graphs word, uh, more or less acknowledged fathers of neural network for graphs. Uh, and then we can slowly enter, we can now enter into the realm of uh, uh, more modern, let's say, approaches. What, uh, in particular, what in this literature you find referred to as convolutional neural network for graphs, or graph convolutional networks, just to make a little bit of mess with the, with the terminology, okay? And of course, the uh, term convolution immediately recalls images, so one would think, is there a straightforward way to map convolutions from images to graphs. Well, in special domain, one would like to do in graphs what, what is done on images. So center a some sort of a special filter on a pixel, in this particular case, center a filter on a node, and then convolve, okay, uh, take into consideration the information from all the surrounding pixel, and then in the graph, in the graph world, take into consideration the information from all the surrounding neighboring nodes. Okay, uh, we're going to be seeing that in the spatial domain, this map is not is not that easy to obtain uh, because there are underlying assumptions in in the images which do not hold on graphs. But before we go that uh, we go there, we will be playing a little bit with the convolutional theorem, uh, which allows us to transform convolution into the into the spatial domain, into multiplication, into spectral domain, provided that we know how to apply a Fourier transformation uh, to our uh, Fourier decomposition to our um, to our signal. Now, this is widely known, for instance, for images. Do we have a Fourier uh, decomposition also for for graphs? Of course, the answer is of course yes, and uh, just. Like very briefly, what the uh, Fourier analysis does is basically try to find a set of uh, of vectors, okay, from a normal to normal basis, which I can use to decompose a signal f. Okay, so I what I need to do in order to be able to apply that uh, that convolutional theorem is find a suitable set of of orthonormal um, vectors, a big or orthonormal basis for my graph. Now the question is that likely, uh, luckily that can be um, can be obtained, and let me first let me enter into this realm of spectral convolutions. 
and we can obtain it by considering this, this scenario, okay? First thing, we are considering a single weighted undirected graph, okay? This is already placing boundaries on what you can do with the spectral convolutions. Then we're gonna be relaxing those, but first thing, there are boundaries, okay? There is a single graph, okay? Not multiple graphs, not a data set of graphs, a single graph. And that is, uh, that can be weighted, that, that is undirected, okay? You can also add, somehow manage things to work with directed graphs, but again, it's a little bit uh, trickier, okay? So the classical assumption is single and undirected with the possibility of being weighted, okay? Meaning that there can be a weight, W, I, J, uh, between two nodes, okay? Now, we do have labels attached to nodes and we hypothesize the existence of this function that is attaching values or if you want labels or signals, okay, xi to nodes i, so this is the equivalent of having labels attached to nodes. So there are signal, there is a graph with signals attached to nodes, okay? So this is my uh, Fourier setting. What I would like to do is to decompose the signal in the graph into a suitable uh, autonomous basis. How do I obtain this autonomous basis? With a graph Fourier transform, which I can straightforwardly obtain by uh, eigen decomposition of a modification of the graph of the Ascensi matrix, what is called the Laplacian. Okay, the Laplacian is uh, is basically this term here, in which uh, in which we do have a uh, the adjacency matrix. The diagonal matrix of the, the degree matrix, sorry, of the of the graph, and an identity matrix which basically adds the self connection to the nodes, okay, to the to the adjacency matrix, to all uh, to all uh, points in the adjacency matrix. Uh, so now, if I take that that Laplacian and I perform an eigen composition of that matrix, what I do obtain is a set of vectors, of course, associated with a set of eigenvalues. And that set of, uh, of, of vectors is the autonormal basis that I need in order to decompose the, uh, the signals attached to my graph. So the graph Fourier transform of a signal f of i, which is a signal attached to a single node in a graph, is just a multiplication of that signal. It's gonna be a vector. Okay, a vector representing some label on UT, where UT is the set, is my autonormal basis, okay, resulting from the eigen decomposition of the, of the Laplacian, okay. And of course, since this is a spectral setting, the eigenvalues of my uh, decomposition are the graph frequencies. And this is a well-known thing in, in, in graph theory, okay, that the eigenvalues of the Laplacian have some have some uh, interesting meaning in, in terms of, of, of communities, for instance. So they tell you well, what is the um, what is the uh, cheapest cut that you can have uh, that you can have between communities in a graph, for instance. Okay, but in this particular case, I'm using the eigenvectors because that provides the autonomous basis that I need that I need it in order to be able to compute a graph convolution. So uh, if we want to port, okay, the concept of uh, co uh, convolutional neural networks to graph, what I would like to do then is to have a convolution of a graph F, okay, in spatial domain with uh, some, uh, with some, uh, um, let me, with some filter G, which is the adaptive filter the adaptive kernel that I have in convolutional neural networks for images, okay? Since I don't know, for the time being, how to compute this in the, in the, uh, in the spatial domain, what I do is I use the Fourier, classical Fourier trick. So I Fourier transform the first signal, I Fourier transform the second, uh, the second signal, the, the filter, and then I invert the Fourier transform, okay? In, in the graph, this Fourier transform here is just uh, provided by the U matrix, okay? The UT matrix. Uh, the second, the second uh, uh, Fourier transform is again the UT matrix, and the inversion of the Fourier transform is just the 
the transpose of the UT matrix, okay, so U. So performing this, uh, this uh, uh, Fourier transformation times Fourier transformation and going back to the spatial domain basically transforms into this vector to matrix multiplications that we see on the right hand side. Now, if we focus on this bit here, the multiplication of the original filter G, which I don't know actually, but let's suppose it's there, times U of T and G is in spectral, in, is in spatial space. So multiplying G in spatial space by UT gives us a convolutional filter in spectral domain, okay? And that convolutional filter in spectral domain, I will call it W. That will be a learnable filter matrix. So that matrix W there is a, is a filter in the spectral domain, okay? And it's a matrix field of parameters which I can learn as part of my learning process, okay? This is gonna be my parameterized convolution, okay? This is exactly my parameterized convolution in, uh, in frequency space, in the spectral space, in which I'm taking here, I do have the collation of the concatenation of all the, uh, the signals in the graph, so basically all the information, information attached to, to the nodes, which is projected on the, on the space span by the, uh, by the autonomous basis of the uh, Laplacian, then this information is combined adaptively and brought back into spatial space, uh, into, the, into the spatial uh, domain by the inverse of the convolution. So by multiplying again for the transpose of the, of the UT matrix. This is a beautiful uh, setting in which I can now perform learning, okay? And uh, the point is, if we start looking at it, uh, into that formalization, I will immediately understand that W has to be some, some kind of M by N matrix, at least, okay? And let's restrict it to be diagonal. This gives you N parameters for a graph of N nodes, okay? You might say, fair enough. Yeah, fair enough, if your graph is a small one. If you're dealing with the social graphs and your social graphs of have like 4.5 billion nodes, you will have 4.5 billion parameters for each, uh, for each layer of your graph convolution on your network, okay? So, although it seems a straightforward choice, that might not be the best setting. And in fact, uh, there are issues in terms of complexity, okay, of the, uh, the amount of parameters that I have in my matrix W, also, Remember, uh, we, we need to remember that W is actually the product of a special filter times a uh, times some a, a basis, okay, uh, an autonomous basis which depends on a Laplacian of a specific graph. So these parameters W would be graph specific, meaning that you can work with a single graph as we assumed. If we have multiple graphs in my data set, I cannot easily port what I've learned from a single graph to a new graph, because the parameters W will be graph specific, okay? And there are also computational problems because uh, forward and inverse transform cost the, uh, the cost of multiplication. So it's a, uh, it's a, a no n squared, okay? And again, if this is the number of nodes, if the graph is big, that's a, that's a lot to pay, okay? There's also another bit, which is the fact that we are basically working with some weird W uh, filter, which is a filter is in somehow spectral domain, but there is no clear interpretation of where it's located uh, in, in spatially. And okay? there's no special binding of that filter. And so people started uh, uh, inventing smart ways of constraining W, so changing this original naive model and introducing uh, simplifications which, which allow to control the complexity of the, of the problem uh, while at the same time um, uh, finding, uh, well, smoother filters, so more well-positioned filter in special space. And one way to do that is basically uh, what uh, Bruno Zaremba Zlam and Likun proposed uh, early on, and that was uh, the fact of making the W metric somehow uh, a function of the uh, eigenvalues. This allows to localize better the filters. Uh, 
now uh, then uh, the Ferradres and Van der Geest uh, represented this uh, this W uh, in a simplified form by means of a Chebyshev polynomial. So basically, they approximated uh, that uh, they find an approximation to that uh, to that representation using Chebyshev polynomials, in which you basically cut at a certain order your polynomial, and the order at which you cut the polynomial uh, determines how many parameters you have in your model. Instead of having n parameters, like the number of nodes in the graph, you will have r parameters, order of the order of the Chebyshev polynomials. This has been brought even further by Kiff and Welling uh, in the iClear paper from 20, 2017, in which they basically simplified further the, uh, the Chebyshev polynomial approach and said, ah, yeah, we can limit to a degree r equal to. Then they place some constraints into the, into the well, they uh, worked with the normalized uh, Laplacian and they demonstrated that the uh, largest eigenvalue can be, uh, can have a um, maximum value approximated around two and using these to uh, normalize uh, to normalize uh, a little bit the formulation, and all in all, also proposing to say that yeah, I'm working with Chebyshev polynomial of degree two, but you know what? I'm assuming that uh, that all the, the 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 orders, the degrees of my Chebyshev polynomial share the same parameter theta. Okay, so there is a single parameter theta which is shared for for uh, for power zero and power one. Okay. All in all, if you take all this assumption on board, this will lead you to have this as implementation of the convolutional uh, neural network in spectral space with a Chebyshev polynomial approximated to R2 and a single parameter, which looks awfully a lot like taking the labels of, a neural net of, a, of the nodes and having them flow through the structure of connectivity of my graph as dictated by the adjacency matrix, okay, and then recombining things, uh, weighting things based on a, on a parameter theta. Of course, you will have multiple theta parameters depending on how many neurons you have, and you can really build a graph convolutional neural network, which is the, uh, this is the model that set the graph convolutional network framework like this, okay. Each of these guy here is a different neuron. Each of these guy here has a different, for instance, uh, uh, theta parameter of the Chebyshev polynomial. So uh, what I do is I start with a graph with a, with a label in each node. What I do is for each of the nodes in, my, um, in this graph, I compute an H1 value, which is just the application of the Chebyshev of the, of the um, H function that we had before, that we've seen before, okay? So the application of a convolution, of the spectral convolution, which is what you have here, and these are the, my W parameters, and then the application of a nonlinearity, just like in any uh, convolutional neural network for, uh, for images, okay? okay? And this I can compute for each node in the graph, and we'll compute a relabeling of each node in the graph. So if this was originally the label of the, of the node, this is going to be the label of that node in the first hidden layer, which is the result of this activation function, the same for all the other nodes in the graph. Then I can move to the second in the layer, my GCN, and compute again uh, the uh, Chebyshev super approximated uh, convolution, but this time instead of using the original X signal attached to, here, to the input graph, I'm using the H1 signals, which has been attached to the graph by the first hidden layer, okay? And then I can replicate this for as many hidden layers as I want. Not really, because what basically was shown is that there was some difficulty, especially at the beginning, in training uh, GCN architecture dependent two or three of these hidden layers, okay? But in the end, what I get is my uh, transformed uh, neural network in which I can have a prediction for each of the single node in the graph, okay, based on, for instance, the H2 value of this node, which fits a, an output layer, or a prediction for the old graph, which can be obtained by somehow, and I will get to that somehow, 
uh, fusing information from all the from all the nodes. Okay. Uh, now let's um, let's have um, a final word on spectral approaches so that we can then move to to the to the other approaches. Spectral approaches are fairly elegant from a graph theoretical perspective, but they have certain limitations which are due to the fact that we are first of all trying to decompose a Laplacian and decomposing a Laplacian can be a no-no when your graph is big. Okay, even if you can of course get around it. Uh, it's mostly limited to undirected graphs with unlabeled edges, but again there are workarounds. Again, and they are workarounds, not naturally supported by the, the theory that you use to develop the map. Okay? Uh, it's quite difficult to control the context diffusion to the graph structure. Why? Because my, my convolution are not localized in much space. They're localized somehow thanks to some spectral properties, but cannot e actually control exactly what these, uh, what these uh, spectral convolutions are doing in the spatial space. Okay? So that's why we now move to the spatial domain convolution, trying to see whether we can do something to uh, really have a sim uh, something symmetric to what we do have uh, in uh, convolutional images, okay? And if you think to images from a graph, a graph perspective, each pixel in an image, it's basically a node in a graph and the edges between uh, pixels uh, basically uh, exist whenever two pixels are neighbors. Okay, like in this particular case, I've picked up this, uh, this, uh, this drunken, uh, drunken squirrel picture, put a, a pixel, put a node for each pixel and then connect a nearby pixel. I've obtained a grid-like representation of my image. So the convolution a, an image convolution in this, uh, in this grid word uh, represent, um, representation, it's straightforward because I'm gonna be centering myself on a node and considering a regular three by three neighborhood in this case of that node. So visual convolution are really like graph convolution, but on a specific graph, which is a regular grid. As soon as you move to, the, to a graph, to an actual irregular graph, things start to crumble because there are key assumptions that make it difficult to apply to, to graphs. First of all, you can define an ordering in a, in a grid because you can assume to always start from top, top, uh, top left and swipe and number your nodes uh, going right and then going down, okay? So a direction and an ordering can be defined consistently between images, so consistently between different graphs. And also there is the assumption of regular neighborhood a node will always have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six neighbors, okay? The nine neighbors, sorry, eight neighbors, God. Now, if I try to apply those assumptions to an irregular graph such as this one, things are not easy, okay? So let's consider this, um, this general graph here. And let's focus on the on the yellow guy here. This yellow guy here uh, is the one is my central pixel. Okay, I want to place a four neighborhood on the, on uh, define a four neighborhood on that on that uh, yellow yellow node. Okay, the problem is that I can define very many different uh, uh, neighborhoods. Okay, this is a four neighborhood obtained by taking this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Okay, nobody forces me to have only direct neighbors. And the second possible neighborhood for the same guy is I pick up this one, this one, and this one. Okay. Uh, then maybe I can have this other one, which is given by this one, this, uh, this one, then this one because I'm not considering uh, this, this connectivity, and this one as well. Okay, so based on a single node, I can obtain very many different neighbors, neighborhoods for a, for, a, for a node, okay? And not only that, even if I obtain, when I, uh, once I have obtained a neighborhood, I will then have to match each of the nodes to one of the position of my, this is my, 
my width matrix, my convolutional filter. Okay, assuming that the yellow node is always in the middle. Okay, yellow node is always W3. Who is W1? You might say that W1 is this guy here. Okay, but when I'm in this uh, four neighborhood, who is the W1? This one or this one? You don't have any general way of breaking these guys because it's a graph, okay? It's an irregular graph, so you can't, okay? Uh, because you cannot define a node ordering which is consistent across multiple graphs, which are, you can't easily define that, and you cannot easily define a node, neighbor, a node neighborhood which is consistent within the same graph, okay? But people have tried to do that. For instance, the Pachisan approach from ICML uh, 2016 tried exactly that. How can I somehow come up with some way of defining node orderings in such a way that I can work with graphs as I work with images? And what they did is basically the leverage graph labeling techniques, the classical with paler lemon uh, uh, appro coloring approach. Uh, for those of you who have never seen it, with paler lemon is basically a procedure that was proposed in order to try to solve the graph isomorphism, sub graph isomorphism problem. Uh, so determine if two graphs are, uh, are the same graph, okay? And in order to do that, uh, what you basically do is you take a node and you consider a node which has a discrete label, you consider it's, its direct neighborhood, the, uh, the direct neighbors will have, a, will have a, as well some, um, some discrete, uh, discrete label, you take the concatenation of these discrete labels, you map them through an hash function into a unique, unique symbol, and you do this for all the nodes. And then you relabel each node in the graph with this hashed label. Then you start again. So you construct again a neighborhood of a node with a, with a, with an, hash, with an hash function that maps uh, uh, same neighborhood to the same symbol and different neighborhoods to different symbols. And you iterate this uh, until you eventually converge and no nodes uh, change, uh, change, uh, change, uh, Ash, fang, ash symbol at some point, okay? And this provides you with, uh, with an ordering in the end. This, this symbols that you obtain provides you with, uh, with an ordering between the nodes and they can be consistent between multiple graphs, okay? And so what they basically do is this, okay? They use this graph coloring technique to obtain, uh, to, to obtain consistent ordering. Uh, Assuming that you can obtain that consistent ordering in a cheap way and it's, mm, there is no theoretical guarantee that you can obtain it in general, there are some pieces which you cannot unless you move to higher order with scalar lemon uh, coloring. But anyway, assuming that you can define an ordering that is coherent between nodes in multiple graphs, then at some point you have to compute the convolution. So at some point you are going to be centering on this yellow pixel and you have to position your filter w1 to w5 on this on this uh, centered on this on this uh, node here now the question is in what order do i map nodes to filter parameters this is a neighborhood normalization problem because you want to be uh, mapping nodes to the specific Ws, W1 to W5, in a coherent way across multiple neighborhoods. That is called the neighborhood normalization problem. It's a well-known NP-hard problem, okay? So you can't really think about solving it uh, hardcore. What they did is basically, again, leverage some graph coloring technique in order to approximately solve it, okay? And basically, they sort of provided this, uh, this, this solution. But uh, yeah, of course, Pachisan is an interesting model which really tries to get the uh, exact correspondent of a, of a convolutional neural network for, uh, for images into the graph world, can handle multiple graphs, both undirected and directed, uh, in a sort of natural way if you confront it with the, with the, spectral, uh, with the spectral approaches. You can have labels on both edges and nodes. You can really reuse all the machinery from, from the uh, convolutional uh, neural network for images, uh, like striding, pooling, even if you want. Uh, 
problem is that you're doing a lot of simplification in there, a lot of approximation in there due to the fact that you don't want to be uh, spending the rest of your life waiting for this thing to converge because you're tackling an NPR problem. So this thing might work or not, uh, depending on how good quality is the ordering that you get from your approximation, from your approximation of the coloring problem. Okay, so uh, there is, um, it's not straightforward to get this model to work with irrespectively of the of the nature of your sample okay because in some cases might be depending on the nature of your graphs might be really difficult to define a coherent order inconsistent order and of course you still have that uh, that uh, Damocles sword of the fact that computational complexity is exponential worst case so that's why people go, went for uh, a different approach, okay? So, uh, all in all, when you deal with graph, uh, with graph neural network, what you're trying to do is to fight the loops, fight the presence of, of, of cycles in the graph in the most efficient way. That's the point. Okay, you want to be tackled that big problem that is having 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 loops in the most efficient way possible. And defining an explicit vertex neighbors and ordering is not possible. Why? Because there are loops. Because there is the isomorphism problem. You can't define uh, coherent orderings in a cheap way. So we need an, an an implicit approach. Okay, so in which neighborhoods. Uh, neighboring information somehow reaches the node, okay? And we do have, uh, while handling the loops, we have, as we've seen in our historical perspective, two ways of doing that in an effective way. One is the contractive approach. So we really use dynamical system like a recurring neural network uh, with guaranteed properties of convergence of the, of the trajectory in state space to obtain stable vertex encoding which is the approach by graph neural networks and its evolutions. For instance, there is an approach by uh, Michele Galicchio, which uses echo state networks, which are uh, recurrent neural networks with the untrained recurrent, uh, net, uh, recurrent weights, but those recurrent weights have a contractive mapping, okay, by definition, because that's, that's built in in reservoir compute in echo state networks. So it goes for free that you can apply them without the need of dynamical constraint to obtain a contractive approach for graph neural networks. I don't have time to get into, into these models, but it's interesting to look into those. We are gonna uh, be delving instead on contextual approaches because these are the most common and most popular, and uh, probably most flexible because they allow you to play with that with very many different concepts uh, in it. And in this particular case, we don't really need uh, to have uh, guarantees of uh, stable attractors because we are not taking a recurrent approach. Our network is going to be fit forward. I'm going to be using layering as a, as a way, as we've seen in initial motivation, to convey the information from, from further nodes into my target node. Okay, so let's, let's now move very quickly to this uh, contextual graph convolution. Uh, let's say that the first probably uh, model to rediscover, because the first model was, uh, to be honest, the one by Michele in 2009, but the first one to rediscover, uh, let's say, the contextual approach was uh, uh, by uh, the paper by David Juveno and, and colleagues at NIPS 2015, and that paper is, is uh, uh, inspired by one, one thing that is well known in, uh, chemical, in, uh, in chemical literature, which is the Molecular fingerprints. Molecular fingerprints are basically trying to, to provide a numerical encoding for, uh, for the structure of a molecule, okay? They do so, this is a chemical compound, this is a fixed length encoding. Chemical compounds can be of different size. You want to find a fixed length encoding for molecules of different size in order to be able to then put a predictor on a fixed length encoder, okay? encoded the information. So how do you do that? Well, basically, uh, you cycle through, in this, in this pseudo code, you cycle through layers, okay? At layer, from layer one to layer R. And at each layer, for each atom in a molecule, so for each node in the graph, read it, what you, you assemble all the neighbors of node A, okay? 
And then what you do, you concatenate these neighbors, their representation, and then you compute a Nash function. Okay, so you take the concatenation of the recurrent representation of a node and its neighbors at a certain level, and you compute from the previous layer, of course. Okay, so if I'm computing the neural representation at this level here, I'm using the encoding from the previous layer. I'm using a Nash function to map this long, uh, long, uh, long vector here into, into, a, into uh, a fixed side uh, representation. And then I convert this hash, uh, this hash value into an index, which is an index in this vector here, fixed side vector. So I'm gonna be incrementing this fixed side vector by one for the fact that I have this ashed, uh, this ashed value here, okay? If uh, at certain point here, I'm gonna be finding the same ashed value, I'm gonna be incrementing this, uh, this number here again by, by another one, okay? So the, what they did is basically take this, let's say, uh, deterministic thing, well, uh, no, this one is deterministic as well, this, uh, let's say, in hard, hard, hard coded thing and transform it into a neural architecture, basically changing the uh, concatenation operator with a, with a summation, which looks very much like summing the inputs of a neuron, then uh, having a smoothness function instead of a Nash function, which looks awfully a lot like a sigmoid activation function, then a specification operator, which was the indexing before, which looks awfully like a, a softmax, and then update my fingerprint by adding the result of my softmax to the output. I'm gonna be obtaining, again, an equivalent of the fingerprints that I had in the previous slides, but this time is obtained through softmax, so it's fully differentiable, and I can train this thing here, because here I do have, uh, sorry, this thing here, because I do have parameters, I can train those and obtain an adaptive uh, neural network, okay? So this really uses layering because you reuse the information from the previous layer to hash, to obtain a new hash, uh, to hash the nodes at the new level, and uh, iteratively you do this for, for all the layers. And her uh, training can be performed by her propagation in this particular case. Now, this thing can be uh, generalized uh, further, and that's been generalized further by the concept of node embedding. The key idea of node embedding is very simple and straightforward. What we're basically trying to do here is, like in the previous case, take a graph, encode the nodes in a graph into a vectorial space, okay, where vertex similarities define however are preserved. So if node K is very different from node I, I hopefully will end up into an embedded space in which the corresponding vectorial representation of node K is far from the corresponding vectorial representation of, of node I. And differently from node J, which is similar to I because it's connected to I, which is gonna end up close in embedded space. So basically what I'm gonna be doing is work on, an, on having this encoder here, which is capable of, capable of implementing this property here of of preserving in a metric space, in the embedding space, similarities or, or differences that exist in the graph space, where similarity and differences in the graph space are basically denoted by what? By similarity in the label attached to the nodes and by how far are, how well connected are two nodes in a graph. Okay? Now, how do I do that? I need a vertex encoder. My vertex encoder function phi, which encodes the k uh, node in my in my graph will return a vectorial coding will of course be a function okay which encodes a node k based on the information on the graph or if I want to be you know somehow possibly efficient instead of considering all the information from all the graph when encoding k I will be considering for instance all only the information from from the neighborhood of a from the um, from the neighborhood of, an, of, a, uh, of a node, okay? Not only that, my phi function would be a parameterized function with parameters theta, why? Because I want this encoder to be learned, okay? I want my encodings, my mappings into the metric space to be somehow, for instance, informed by a supervised error. 
or informed by an unsupervised error for what matters, okay? But I want to be able to control how things are mapped based on some cost function to optimize, okay? And you can fit into this scheme very many different models, which just differ in the way they compute encoding and the loss, okay? So, again, assuming that I'm doing the chip thing, so I'm finding an encoding of a, of a target uh, node based only on the neighbors. Uh, how do I uh, generate this? Okay. How do I define a neighborhood of a node? One straightforward way to do that would be I consider only at the ascent nodes for so the neighborhood from for node four. Okay, the neighborhood for node four is going to be three, two, and five, which are direct neighbors. But this is not the most general case. The most general case, for instance, can consider uh, sampling nodes. Okay, so uh, instead of considering all three, two, or, or five, I just sampled some some of them because, for instance, my network might have might be very highly connected, or I might be able to sample random walks in the graph as, as a neighborhood instead of a direct uh, neighbor. So. Uh, a neighborhood uh, for my node uh, four would be one, two, five, six, because that's a decent, uh, uh, sorry, one, two, four, because that's a random walk leading to my node, or six, five, four, because it's, uh, that's another random walk leading to my, to my node. Okay, so neighborhood can be defined in a flexible way, depending on what you need. And uh, so basically, how does it work? In this particular case, if I'm restricting to single direct neighbor, if I'm computing the encoding of one, I will take into consideration for, for instance, the encoding of two, feed it into the aggregation aggregator, this magic aggregator function, and obtaining uh, the encoding for node one. Same thing I can do, for instance, for, uh, for obtaining the encoding of node two. I'm only using direct neighbors. In this case, direct neighbors are one, three, and four. I take the encoding of one, three, and four, aggregate them through my magic box, green box, and obtain node two. Problem is that encoding of one and two are mutually, mutually dependent again. Okay, so two is used for one and, one, and one is used for two. What's the solution? Again, is layering, okay? So I first compute an embedding independently for each node. This is my magic box computing and embedding for node one, for node two, for node three, and node four, at level zero. This is why I have superscript zero. And at level zero, I only consider the labeling information of the single node. This is layer zero. Then I move to layer one. And when I'm computing a layer one, the encoding for node two, I'm taking the encoding for my neighbors. So node two has neighbor one, three, and four. I'm taking the encoding from one, three, and four from layer zero. So there is no mutual dependency between these two guys because this other guy here is gonna be taking the encoding for, for node two from the previous layer and so on, okay? Note that, for instance, a layer two, I'm picking up uh, to encode the layer uh, node four, I will be using the encoding from five, three, and two from layer one, okay? So the encoding on node four at layer two will depend on what? On, on, the, on the information on node two, three, and five. But guess what? The information on node two at this level depends also on node one and four, as you can see here. So eventually, at layer two, node four will know things about two, three, and five directly, but also one and four indirectly, okay? And five indirectly, and six indirectly through five. So this layering thing allows the more layer I had, the more information I can put to the single node in the graph. Okay. And there are no causal dependencies within the layer. Okay, so each layer aggregators can be parameterized differently or with side weights. So basically what I typically will have is this uh, green box aggregator to have its own parameter, this green box here to have its own parameter, this green box here to have its own parameters, and the same parameters are shared the same layer, okay? But what is inside of the box? This is a box that receives input from a certain number, a variable number of inputs, which is 
defined by an enabler of a node that spits out the new encoding. And of course, there is a learning model inside it a neural network capable of handle sites varying neighborhoods, okay? And the simplest way that can come to your mind to handle a sites varying neighborhood is what? Is a function that takes, some, uh, takes all the inputs, okay? And the inputs in this case are the neighbors of a node. So I sum on all the neighbors and I take the encoding of each neighbor and I divide it by the total number of neighbors. So I'm averaging the contribution from the, near, uh, from the hidden representation of all the neighbors, okay? I obtain this average vector, I multiply it by my vector of parameters WL, okay? And then I add a contribution from my encoding, this is the node, the, the target node from the previous layer, okay? And I pass everything through a nonlinearity. I've obtained a very nice and simple model to handle uh, size varying inputs by averaging, uh, using average as an aggregator, okay? Neighbor average. And this is actually uh, the model that you use, that you have, for instance, in a uh, node to vec, okay? Then uh, in Graph Sage, uh, which is a later paper by, that generalized the uh, uh, node to vec, uh, Hamilton Yingel Leskovich said, yeah, you can replace that node, uh, the, the uh, neighborhood average with whatever reasonable aggregation strategy can come to your mind. For instance, yeah, that's the classical one, the mean, but you can use the max pooling, for instance, okay? Instead of taking the mean, I can take the max, okay? The parameterized max. Why not? It's again a function which can aggregate an, a variable number of inputs and return a fixed length out. You can even use sequential aggregation. This is one of the proposed uh, uh, proposed uh, approach. Is you think, can take a long short memory, feed it with a uh, with a, with the neighborhood of a node in a random ordering, or following the ordering of the random walk, for instance, and use that as an aggregator. Okay. Then, well, at some point, the thing was elaborated further, and in the graph isomorphism network, uh, basically uh, the same group in a sense, came out with a study of uh, the expressivity of a graph neural network in differentiating structures, okay? So they studied if two different structures can be discriminated by graph neural, uh, neural networks. And they came out with the answer that graph neural networks have the same limitation that Westphaler-Lehmann uh, test of uh, order one uh, have, okay? And not only that, that there exists a class of graph neural network that can discriminate exactly the same number, or the same type of, uh, of structures that uh, was failed lemon one test uh, discriminates, but that is only the class of, um, of, uh, of aggregation function, which are uh, injective function of multisets. And the ones that we've seen before are not injective function on the multisets, but the sum is, okay? So basically, the main operational, uh, let's say, message of this paper is saying, yeah, you should be using some as, a, as, a, as a, an aggregation function, okay? Which is exactly the same uh, function that uh, Alessio Michelis who, uh, neural network for graphs was using. So we rediscovered like, yeah, 10 years afterwards that some works well with the with, the, with graphs and it's the more, uh, more powerful than average, which was already known. But still, this, this paper has provided, uh, uh, let's say, the stimulus to reason about the, the, the uh, discriminative power of, of neural network, which is, which is good, okay? Uh, well, assuming that you have obtained uh, your node embedding, how can you use them? That, the following question will be that, how can I use them? Well, if I have a node embedding for all the nodes, I can take the node embedding from a specific layer or from all the layers or from the only the last layer, sum them up, okay, obtain an encoding for the whole graph and apply, for instance, a predictive uh, function on, uh, on, the, on this uh, graph encoding to classify the graph or to predict uh, uh, a continuous value for the graph. I can also operate on a node level. Okay, I can take the, as an input, the encoding of this node, train uh, a predictor at the node level, and for instance, classify 
this node into one of possible different uh, classes. Okay? And same I can do for, for each node. It also works in an inductive uh, uh, learning setting. For instance, if at some point a new node exists here, I might want to be able to train a model that tells me where to attach the node. How? By taking the encoding of this node and the encoding of another node and test whether, with a classifier, whether there should exist a, uh, a link between the two. Okay? Or if a new node uh, arrives and is attached already to the, to the to the single to the network, I can basically propagate the information, compute the encoding, and make prediction on this new node. The, these embeddings can be trained uh, based on a on a supervised error at the end of this layering. So basically, back propagating through all these layers, and assume since everything in here is differentiable, typically. Okay, you can also train unsupervisedly using an appropriate loss at this at this point here. Now what we have obtained is an effective way to obtain context propagation from further nodes in the in the, in a graph to every node, every other node in the graph by simply putting enough layers, okay, feed forward layers. The point is that the number of layers in practice is limited because if you want to back propagate through all of them there are all the issues uh, associated with, uh, with the fading uh, or exploding gradient that needs to be tackled. So you need jumping knowledge connections. So basically skip connection to allow the, the, the gradient to flow, nevertheless. And there are, uh, and even if you do that, there are oversmoothing issues which uh, uh, are known to affect uh, convolutional graph convolution and neural networks. So basically this means that uh, from a certain point onwards, uh, the encoding of nodes tend not, does not tend to, to change if you add more layers. Okay, the, everything tends to be uh, to become the same to receive the same encoding. So uh, you're layering, but you're not really obtaining a more refined representation for your for your nodes. Okay, there is another thing that in general, if you use the approach that we've seen so far, the embeddings are typically task dependent. Okay or any way they need undefined similarity in node space. So you need to define a cost function to define similarity. That is why I bring you as a last example, a layer-wise approach to learn graph embeddings. This is something that we initially presented at ICML in 2018. It's, a, it, it's an architecture which is basically, which is called contextual graph micro model. What it does is it, it learns an unsupervised model here which provides a representation of a graph in a fixed side representation on the top of which you can build all the supervised uh, tasks you want. But this representation here is learned in a unsupervised way, okay? Actually, the model that we have here that is realizing this is unsupervised, is also probabilistic, and it's also deep because it uses la layering pretty much uh, like the rest, okay? And how does it work? So basically, it assumes that uh, um, I do have my, my, my layer, my layered approach. So at a certain layer, I'm focusing on a node. And uh, I'm basically have a node represented in terms of random variables. And these random variables are not observed. And I have a state transition function, which is a probability distribution from the encoding of all the neighbors of a node from the previous layer, okay, to the new encoding, okay, pretty much like in the usual layered approach, okay. This distribution here is a distribution of Q of U conditioned on a certain number of nodes, which is, which tends to explode, to become untractable, so we have included a certain number of <coughs> Um, additional hidden random variable which allows to simplify this joint distribution into a simpler form, basically. And the graph encoding is the vector of Q use state counts. Okay, so basically this random variable here is basically a multinomial random variable. So what this model does, it assigns each node in a in a in a in a graph to a specific uh, to, to a specific label, okay? 
And so it does so through a, let's say, a layered approach in which we freeze and we incrementally generate a new layer in a, in a completely incremental way, okay? And it trains each of these layer is a separate graphical model, is a separate uh, probabilistic model trained in isolation. And then once it's trained, it feeds the new layer, which is trained in isolation while these black ones stay frozen. And then it will in turn inform the other one. And so you can use layers and layers and layers of this one. And everything here can be trained by expectation maximization. Okay. And uh, what this model shows is that here with this particular layered approach, which does not need to have a back propagated signal from the output layer to the inner layer because it tra is trained incrementally on a layer by layer basis, uh, layering matters. This is um, the accuracy on, on, a, on a graph classification benchmark as the number of layers increase. Note what happens, this is um, generalization accuracy that as you add more layers, the accuracy increases, which is not something that you do really observe often in graph neural networks. You can have as much as 15, 20 layers obtaining increase in generalization, okay? Uh, different, uh, let's say different colored uh, uh, nodes basically, uh, curves basically mean that uh, that they use a, a larger, uh, different number of, uh, of symbols to encode, uh, to encode my, uh, my, uh, uh, my notes. So this is using, blue is using 10 symbols, five is using five, uh, sorry, orange is using five symbols, green is using 20 symbols and so on. Uh, in other words, more, more symbols means more parameters, okay? So as you see, using many parameters, it's okay, it's, it's informative, uh, but at, from a certain point onwards, because you need layering more than, than many parameters in the single layer, okay? And also you can, thanks to the probabilistic approach, you can easily obtain also nice interpretation because this is a graph, you can visualize the posterior, so the probability of each of the different symbols assigned to each of the nodes in the graph. And you can see that, for instance, in this community here, they tend to have the same distribution of posterior of symbols, meaning that they tend to be similar, okay? And as soon as you keep layering and layering, they tend to be differentiated. You see here at this level, a layer two, they are very much similar. At, at some point, this group of, uh, of uh, nodes here, this group of nodes here are similar but different in posterior from these ones, for instance. Okay. So thanks to the probabilistic approach, you also have a way to interpret your, uh, the results of your trained model. There are other, uh, this is not ours, it's not the only case of unsupervised uh, probabilistic neural model. There is one from QM Benjo. This one is basically, is not, is using graph neural networks to implement the local potential function of a conditional random field. So the graph is actually a conditional random field and is using the uh, graph neural networks to approximate the local potentials, okay, in this case. The deep graph infomax instead really works on, uh, on graph structure data. The idea of the deep graph infomax is interesting because they are doing unsupervised learning by seeking to optimize this loss function. And what this loss function is saying is that you want to obtain encoding for a specific node in the graph I, which is highly coherent with a generalized encoding for the full graph S. And at the same time, you want encoding for, for, uh, for node J uh, to be very from a node J from a different uh, from a different graph to be very different from the overall encoding uh, uh, of the of the specific uh, graph uh, S. So this pushes encoding of nodes that pertain to a graph to be similar to the global encoding of the graph and nodes that pertain to other to other graphs to be different. Okay, so it's a contrastive. Uh, is a contrastive uh, uh, loss, which is uh, which is uh, interesting, but it requires a little bit uh, of tricks in order to work because this is basically based on a, on an estimate of a mutual information, and in order to estimate your mutual information, you need a probability which you don't have, so you use a binary discriminator uh, that tells you how likely it is for this 
H to be part, uh, to be to be in this in this graph here. Okay, and also you need a way to sample a reasonable way to sample nodes that don't belong to to a graph. Okay, so the negative examples. So now we are nearing towards the end of the allocated time so let me try to rush very quickly through some interesting advanced topics and research directions okay in a convolutional neural network you would like to have pooling okay this is true for images this might be true for for graphs as well how do you define pooling in a graph if this is your graph how you pull a graph Pooling in a graph is a graph reduction strategy. So you want to find communities like this triangle here of very connected neurons, uh, very connected uh, nodes, in order to be able to transform this community of three nodes here into a single node after pooling. And then you transform this, connection, uh, this connected uh, component here into a single node and, and create a new graph of connected communities and possibly iterate this process. Okay, so pooling in graphs basically it's about finding communities, sensible communities into a graph and transforming the original graph into a graph of connected communities. There are different approaches in literature to do that, approaches that try to do this through an adaptive uh, pooling method which is fully differentiable, graph theoretical approaches which see community and there is a global aggregation approach as well. Uh, of course, the big picture is that you want to uh, interleave conv graph convolution with graph pooling operator and then a new graph convolution which will now operate on the reduced graph and then in the end you will have an aggregation function which collapses the reduced graph into a single node which will provide then uh, a full encoding for the full graph. Okay? And among the different approaches that you can find in literature, there is diff pool, which uses basically a, um, a differentiable graph pooling, which I, essentially, if this is the original graph, it tries, it uses an additional graph neural network passed through a softmax to clusterize graph uh, node embeddings, similar node embeddings into single communities, okay? So these are pulled into, a, and these nodes here are pulled into a unique community at this level by a softmax function because they activate the same softmax component. Be aware that this has to be a differentiable operation. So you're not really pruning the original adjacency matrix, okay? You're just uh, preserving the original uh, uh, adjacency matrix and recombining by a dense, uh, by a dense matrix of, of uh, recombination weight the original, the original nodes. So the, even if it looks like that you're reducing the graph, you're in practice you're keeping all the graph in, in memory, all the addition matrix in memory all the time, which makes this uh, this, uh, this, uh, this method here heavy, computationally very heavy. There are other approaches which are graph theoretical ones. They relax the fact that you need to operate on dif with differentiable operators. For instance, the KPX pool, which we have been working on. Uh, across the across the last and, the, and this year, uh, basically six communities that are k plexes. K plexes are a relaxation of clicks. Okay, so if you add k compo k links, a k plex becomes a click. Okay, so it's a click mixing k links to become a to, to become a link. And you can use this as a sensible way to define communities and re and reduce the the graph accordingly. Or you can factorize the adjacency the matrix. We have a, a work that, uh, that uses leverages uh, no negative matrix factorization basically to cluster the nodes. This is again non differentiable, but really we don't care because it's not parameterized. And then there are approaches which, uh, instead of trying to pull into communities, try to find a single, uh, single uh, to aggregate uh, um, the encoding of multiple nodes into a single graph encoding. Sort pooling is one of such. Uh, I'm afraid I have to rush through this because it's, um, it's, already, it's already late. So let me just go very quickly through a couple of um, interesting uh, other, uh, other topics. Uh, for instance, another topic that is uh, fairly interesting is how do I scale graph neural network to large scale graphs? Uh, like social network, uh, graphs with billions of, of nodes, 
for instance, you need uh, ways to operate effectively on graph neighborhoods. You can't always use all the neighborhood of a, of a node. You need, for instance, to sample, okay, or maybe to to work on uh, on on communities of a node, okay. So to uh, identify communities, uh, strict communities, and, and use those as a let's say as a neighborhood for a node. Or you can use active learning, for instance. So instead of sampling the, the neighbors, you can actively find the neighbors that are more informative for my node. Then there are also topics related with uh, how do I perform high performance computing on graphs because I cannot expect uh, GPU computing to work well on irregular computation that I have in a graph. Uh, attention is widely used in graph, for instance, in order to weight the neighbors of a graph instead of having the uh, the weights contribute the, all the neighbors of a node to contribute with the same weight i can have uh, an attention value being generated for each of the neighbor and used to weight the contribution of this of these neighbors okay and there is a the initiator of this uh, of this uh, method is certainly the graph attention network from velikovich at i clear 2018 there are studies on the theoretical properties of the graph. So how thing changes in terms of what kind of structures can be differentiated by a graph neural network based on what aggregation function they use, what properties they have, uh, what invariance properties they have, the different aggregation information that they use. Uh, there is another very interesting area of research which is connected with uh, graph generation. So whenever uh, how do I obtain, a, how do I learn a model that can generate a graph as an output, okay? And there are different approaches to do that. One is adjacency based, so basically what these models try to do is try to generate the adjacency matrix of a graph. And uh, there are others that are structure based that they really try to generate the structure of the graph. Okay, for instance, they first generate the nodes and then they try to link the nodes in the most sensible way. Uh, an example of the first case is the graph variational autoencoder, which generates the adjacency matrix up to k vertices. Since you are generating an adjacency matrix in output, you need to limit the maximum number of, of nodes you can generate. Okay, uh, and that's the main limitation of the thing. And also, you know, allocation of, of, uh, of uh, of a node inside of an inside of an adjacency matrix is a, typically a, a non-differentiable operation, so you need to approximate things with double softmax or reinforce, or you don't care. You go uh, uh, you go along with that even if that is supposedly non-differentiable, as it's done in many cases, like in, the, in this case here. But when you work with the adjacency matrix, you have this issue, and also the issue that you're of how you compute the discrepancy between the predicted matrix and, uh, and the original matrix that you had before. Uh, that's why people, the most effective models in literature typically rely on a structure-based approach. For instance, we have proposed this model here, which, um, which is a, a language-based approach to generate a graph that uses two recurrent models Basically, this uh, recurrent neural network here generates, is uh, responsible for generating, for placing the attention on one specific uh, node, so generating a new node or keep generating the same node for some time. And the second neural network receives this input plus some state and generate the nodes it has to connect to. Okay, so basically one node is responsible for generating one network is responsible for generating the, the source and the other one is responsible for generating the, the, um, the destination, so to link nodes. Uh, there are people that have been working on attacking graph neural networks. So how can I uh, generate a graph which uh, basically uh, alters, alters the prediction with, with respect to what I expect? Okay, so how can I generate a graph taking, a, taking a, an original graph which was a, a toxic molecule and modify it only slightly to make it become non-toxic for my, for, my, for my predictor, even if it's still toxic. And connected to that is the topic of how do I interpret the prediction of graph neural network. There is a nice work by Xing group, uh, by the group at Stanford, 
which basically uh, no, sorry, they were at Harvard, uh, which basically uh, tries to identify what are the nodes that are more relevant and the feature of the nodes that are more relevant to come to a specific prediction in a graph or what subgraphs of a graph are responsible for a specific prediction. We instead are taking a different approach at the, at the University of Pisa, given a graph predicted, for instance, a molecule to, uh, predicted to be non-toxic, we want to find the closest counterfactual. So the, close, uh, the closest graph to this one that is, uh, uh, for instance, pr uh, predicted as toxic by, by the neuron actor. So try to explain a prediction in terms of counterfactuals using basically a reinforcement learning based approach. Let me conclude very quickly by a very important and relevant issue in graph neural network, which is that of fair benchmarking of deep uh, learning for graphs. Uh, this has been an issue for, for years and we've been working on that because many works have, have appeared, many works have provided their own different, uh, let's say, setup in which they have assessed uh, their models on standardized benchmark in literature. Not enough standardized because people were using different folds, different approaches, uh, using only one, uh, without using validation sets, but only using tenfold without no validation. So basically optimizing on the, on the generalization error. And there is a paper, if you're interested in that, there is a paper from my group that basically shows what happens when you do that and how things can get really bad, such as having most of the approaches in literature that when compared on a fair, with a fair approach, don't, don't go better than a baseline that doesn't use the structure, okay? So this tells much also about the, the data sets that we're using. And if you're interested, we are releasing this Python library that help speeding up reproducible research on graph neural networks. This library allows you to straightforwardly uh, plug in your model, your graph neural network, and obtain a validation in classical benchmark in a fair and standardized setting and comfortable with others. And everything is based on, uh, on, uh, on a big lack of having a certain number of uh, available deep, uh, deep learning for graphs library, like PyTorch Geometric or Deep, deep Graph Library, which works both in PyTorch and in TensorFlow. This one works only in, uh, in PyTorch, of course. That provides you with a very, uh, with ready-made implementation of much of the works that I've shown before in already, already prepared into a library. Okay. with all the possibility of loading uh, classical standard uh, standard benchmark also to, to play around tutorials and so on. And there are luckily also standardized, uh, happening to, uh, starting to, to be diffused this year, basically, uh, standardized benchmark sites like the Open Graph benchmark of the TU datasets, which are a collection of standardized data sets together with standardized folds, together with standardized leaderboards, with standardized ways of uh, computing generalization errors. So please, 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 when you develop your model, try to be as coherent as possible uh, with, uh, with the standard that is being developed in the future. Okay. Use the classical machine learning uh, risk estimation approaches, the correct ones. Uh, I don't have time to go through the application, but consider there are many applications about predicting properties of chemical compounds, so you feed your model with the uh, with a, with a chemical graph and obtain assessment in terms of toxicity, solubility, or whatever quantum mechanical properties of, of, your, of your molecule in input, and you obtain this in milliseconds instead of hours of computation that you would require with simulation methods. We at PISA have, uh, for instance, a model that can generate molecules, and can generate molecules with drug that are correct, uh, not like graphs that look like molecules. Correct chemical, correct uh, molecules using a fragment-based approach. Please look into our paper if you're interested, because we can generate molecules with properties of generated molecule which have the same distribution of chemical physical properties of the original uh, sample. Okay, and there are approach. There are papers that shows how to use uh, network data to predict the side, uh, side effect of drugs. Drugs are nodes in this, in this graph, and you will predict the existence of a unknown link between drugs, which states, careful, these two drugs, even if you don't know it, 
they, they tend to interact badly. Okay. And yeah, there are, there is an initiative out, which is the, an initiative about uh, fighting COVID-19, help supporting the fight against COVID-19 with deep graph networks. And if you're interested in to that, contact me because I'm leading that initiative, which is an initiative within the, within the Clara Network, which is a, Clara, a network of uh, European AI centers. And what we are doing that, we are using uh, graph neural networks in drug repurposing for trying to, to provide methodologies that help speeding up the screening of possible drugs to cure the effects of COVID. Uh, you find application in functional brain images because brain networks are networks, so there are graph structure data. You can use them, for instance, to feed a classifier to tell you if a uh, brain has Alzheimer or not. Uh, you can use them if you want to get reach to predict the, uh, the stock, stock behavior because you know that uh, uh, industries have a relationship between each other and this relationship can be represented by a graph. So you can use this information together with the uh, sequential data coming from time series of the, of the shares to predict how they're going to go, how they're going to rank tomorrow. You can use them on point clouds, as we said. You can use them to analyze ICT systems. Uh, this is just my conclusion. You just find the wrap up here. Let me just be very quick on, on, on this. There's gonna be a special session on learning for structured data in this IJCNN. So please attend and we have a lot of very interesting papers in there. There is a neural network uh, task force on learning for structured data, which I have the luck to, to lead uh, together with uh, Filippo Maria Bianchi Lorenzo Livi. This is the, new, the, um, the website. Please check and contact if interested. And this is my advertising time. If you uh, like this very rushed tutorial, you have far more information into a paper which is on the ARCSIF, but it's now been accepted for uh, neural networks, for the Neural Networks Journal, which is the first article that you see there. Please use our Python library, and there's going to be a longer version of this tutorial upcoming in Ekai 2020, and this is free. Okay, so you're free to register to Ekai 2020 and to follow the longer and less rushed version of this tutorial. Many thanks for attending and sorry for the rushing.